Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Phil. How are you today? Hi, Michael. Doing great, thank you. How are you? Really well, thank you. I'm delighted. You're my first guest of 2023, so thank you. <laughs> Ray, lovely. And happy new year, by the way. Happy new 2023. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Looking forward to what this year might bring, as always. And um, yeah, we, we connected via some Discord server. Uh, we're connected on LinkedIn. And that's how this interview came about. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. Definitely. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so I, I, feel like a, I feel like it's quite colourful as well. So uh, yeah, this, um, um, this should be good. I'm uh, looking forward to this as well. Oh, well, that's even better when you say that. Um, now, uh, I always start with a very simple question, which is very open-ended, Phil. I'm sorry about it. Uh, and that is, so Phil, please share your story and how you got to where you are today. Sure, sure thing. I mean, I feel like there is a lot to tell because I feel like I've done so much uh, to get to this point, uh, whether it's work, life, school, um, everything in between. Um, so yeah, when I say colourful, this um, this should hopefully paint a really really nice picture. So so here goes. Brilliant. Uh, so the po- so the point that I'm at right now is that uh, I'm an experienced paralegal. I'm an aspiring lawyer with about a year or so's training to go before I qualify. I'm a regular writer and contributor for my own network and for a well known legal content and resource platform. And I'm a reasonably new uh, workplace inclusion consultant, and I do work for and with a company that works with its clients to make their workplaces and processes a lot more accessible and inclusive. And I'm also at the baby stages of uh, creating my own business and my own services. Um, so yeah, looking through the, uh, the past guests that have appeared on this podcast, so all, all these really brilliant people, uh, I do feel like a bit of a baby myself, really. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, for, for me, that's just motivation to keep doing what, what I'm doing and uh, to keep going to create something brilliant. So, yeah, this is wonderful motivation for me. Uh, but certainly to get to this point, um, it did require me to take the scenic route, if you will. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'll say right at the start, because, you know, this is my identity and it is who I am, uh, that uh, I am autistic and uh, probably ADHD as well, judging by presentations that I've been noticing and that I've been learning a bit more about from some colleagues. So my experiences through school, university, work and everything have all been through that unique lens, which I find to be equal parts difficult, but equal parts beautiful at the same time. So in terms of schools, like if we if we go back to the beginning, I didn't really spend a huge amount of time at schools in my local area. Uh, My primary school was a reasonably small single sex 25 pupil school based in Litchfield uh, which was a county away from uh, from my home in the black country so it was a bit of a jaunt yeah and it, it was around that point when I was about six seven eight so quite young that an assessment into me was carried out by an educational psychologist and a diagnosis of autism came back shortly after and this was after a uh, staff at my nursery school before my primary school described me to my parents as, and I'm quoting here, highly intelligent, but difficult to handle. Uh, but yeah, I, I can joke about because there is a bit of truth in that. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yes. I mean, I was a good student throughout, really. Um, you know, I was laser focused on what I was there to do, which was learn, do the things that were set for me. Uh, I think looking back on things now, my parents did try their best to work with the staff at that school to try and prepare me for later life. Yeah. And I do remember at that time, that's how they got me involved with uh, some other programs that were going on, uh, including Cub Scouts as well, uh, at around eight or nine or so. Yeah. Which for me being so young, that was a bit of a challenge because I was so used to like coming straight home from school every day uh, mm. on a Monday night. So staying later in the evening was, you know, it felt alien to me, really. It was a shake up to my routine. And not something that I was particularly used to at the time. And, you know, I found out that it's not really that uncommon for autistic children, which you know, I was at the time, to be lost and confused when you know, their routine or their reference points are changed, you know, suddenly like that. 
And then for the last six months or so at primary school, I was uh, spending time at a much larger mainstream primary school that was more local to me. Um, it had around 480 pupils there and it was, um, th there were boys and girls there. So a big shake up uh, to what yes. I was used to for, for all those years. I think it was there to try and prepare me for a mainstream secondary school, um, which was why it was so short, uh, but it didn't really work. So, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> And then secondary school was, for me was a residential boarding school that was based in Tewkesbury in Gloucestershire. And because it was so far away, uh, I would stay overnight. So I'd stay from Sunday night until Friday afternoon and be home for the weekends. So certainly from the early stages, um, you know, I was having to deal with, you know, not only that shake up again, but, you know, the homesickness that comes from yes. you know, being so far away from home, away from parents, away from what I know, really. And yeah, I wasn't the most comfortable when I was when I was 11 or 12 years old, if I'm being honest. In terms of my academics, I think they were pretty standard, really. I sat GCSEs in 2006. I got myself a round of Bs and Cs and I sat ASNA levels in 2008. And they were kind of disappointing. I'm not going to lie. They were, you know, Ds mostly. Uh, but it was enough to get me into undergrad university to start my law degree. Um, so I was happy with that, really. You know, I, I took that and ran with it. But when and... when did you when did you sorry to interject then? When did you discover that you wanted to go get involved with law? How did that it was come around, about? Yeah, it was around 14 years old, I believe. Uh, it was at the time when I was having to pick GCSEs and a time when we were encouraged to think about what we wanted to do with our later lives. Um I was, you know, I, I guess I was going through the motions a little bit at the time. I was thinking about what I wanted to do. I was taking advice from tutors, parents. Um, and my dad, my, uh, at the time, sorry, my dad was a university tutor. So he floated the idea that uh, I could become a key, I could become a teacher. Yes. Um, and you know, all the other people had their own ideas of what they wanted to do as well. Um, whether that was go to university or maybe do apprenticeships or get straight into work, things like that. Yes. But I knew I wanted to use the skills that I had uh, in order to, you know, help as many people as I could, really. You know, I knew at the time I was, you know, I was a helpful soul and I wanted to do good by as many people as I could. Yeah. And I was really curious about um, a lot of, well, on local news, when I was finishing school and coming back to dormitories and like the social areas, uh, the news would be on. And I'd be really curious about how a lot of the uh, criminal law uh, matters going through uh, local crown and magistrates courts were reached because really all we got at that time was you know xyz was found guilty of such and such and i got really curious about how that decision was reached so yes i wanted i wanted to learn more about that and you know i wanted to like really tap into that curiosity that i had right. so fueled fueled by that interest and I'm not going to lie, after a couple of uh, crime dramas that I was enjoying as well, yes. uh, I, thought, I, thought, uh, I thought that law was a really interesting pathway for me. And so I picked my GCSEs and A-levels uh, accordingly to give myself the best possible head start for when I started undergrad university at 18 years old. Right. So um, e e even, even at a young age, I felt like I was pretty clear about what I wanted to do and I guess I was almost like laser focused and single minded on that, um, whether that was, you know, for my benefit or my detriment. Um, I think it's the, there's been a bit of both uh, in that regard. Well, I think it is quite young to make up your mind about the direction you want to go into. I think it's a gift really for you to be able to know that at that age. I certainly didn't have a clue even even today, I don't even know, you know, <laughs> uh, where did it, what direction did I want to go into? Um, you know, you refer to baby steps. I think we're all still in baby steps, to be honest, uh, in terms of building our businesses or not, <laughs> uh, whatever the case might be. But I, yeah, I think it's fascinating that you knew at such an early age the direction you wanted to go into, which I think is, you know, it's, it's a real plus, definitely. OK, carry on. Yeah, no, I, I was really happy with that myself. And, you know, I felt like I had that sort of guiding rod, uh, that lightning rod, if you will, uh, as yeah. to where to focus, focus my efforts and focus my work, really. Got it. Got uh, it. 
and yeah during my secondary school as well I was getting involved with so much as well um like it, so many things were on offer that we could take part in uh, there was Duke of Edinburgh's awards that I was getting involved in um yeah I even had even had a chance to meet the Duke himself at St James's Palace at an award ceremony which was you know really lovely yeah we had sports leader awards that were going on I took part in that I was coaching the under 14s badminton team as well so that that was really good to get involved in I was a regular face for a lot of music events like uh, school carol services. I was playing in the school brass and woodman band. I took my clarinet with me. And then the more fun stuff like arts festivals and music festivals, I took my bass guitar with me. And yeah, I was a regular face in that for well, the entire time I was there for seven years. Uh, and yeah, I was I was also a pool lifeguard and I was a school monitor and a prefect. Uh, so yeah, there was... <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was you know, really splitting myself into like multiple persons at the same time, which was equal parts great, but equal parts tiring as well. Yeah, I can imagine. But you just had an interest to keep busy, I guess. My Even back then, I knew that my brain just wanted to keep busy. It wanted to keep doing things and just keep keep going, keep discovering and just keep trying new things, really. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I figured at like 16, 17, 18 years old, if I tried a lot, a lot of things, and then not be too much setback, I suppose. Like I had that safety net of school with me. Like I was able to make mistakes. I was able to find things that I liked and like find myself. That gave me like that bit more encouragement to try all these new things, really. Yeah. And and do you think do you think that or do you know <laughs> from all the research that you've done, is that pretty typical from somebody who's been labeled? with autism uh it, it's difficult to say because you know my my experiences and my perspective and like my life is my own really same as um every um every individual autistic person uh, mm. really um so it, I, I guess it's difficult to say really but um I wouldn't be surprised if there were others like me who who had that really busy brain and had lots mm. of stuff going on that they wanted to sort of try and that they wanted to use to try and satiate themselves like satiate their interests that they yes. wanted to do so many things i wanted to like di dip their toes in so many things really mm. Mm. so it, it wouldn't surprise me to be honest no and were you ever advised to not do so much saying oh you know calm down you know take, just just pick a lane just to do one thing at a time i was i was on occasion yeah um, yeah <laughs> <laughs> it, it, um, like even coming to the end of uh, sick form uh, when I was 18 and I think it was about March or April time when it was like peak A level uh, revision time and exam time I was you know I, I was encouraged by staff just to say Phil slow down put these on the back burner you've got other things to worry about which yeah. was fair enough really you know I, I my priorities I had to make clear at the time and you know, for the last few months of sick form, that was A level exams, A level coursework. So yeah, yeah, a few things did have to take the back burner. Um, but even so, I'm glad that I got involved in them, and I'm glad that I gave things a try. Brilliant! It sounds fantastic. I, I I agree with you wholeheartedly that why not go full out and try as many different things as you can. You know, if you've got the brain capacity. And it's about enjoying yourself, right? It's about why well, don't have a go at it and see how good you could be at it. And if you are not good enough, if you don't think you're good enough, then stop it. Do something else. <laughs> Just keep going. <laughs> yeah, I love that, it. That's it, isn't it? You know, we, we lose nothing by trying. We lose nothing by, by giving it a go. And, you know, we never know. We might like it. We might enjoy it. We might be good at it. Um so, yeah, but yeah, we never know until we try. And yeah, I was glad to have that safety net uh, when I was at school just to like, just to try everything. Yeah, really. So, yeah, really, really happy with that. Okay, okay keep going, Phil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so after after secondary school, I got myself into university. Uh, my undergrad university was Nottingham Trent. Uh, so again, I was staying away from home uh, in what was at the time a foreign city to me. Uh, yes. So, but I get... I guess I felt a bit more prepared that way because I'd spent seven years living away from home. So it wasn't as much of a shock to me as it might have been for, say, other you know, fresh students. 
coming straight out of like mainstream schools and this is the first time they've lived away from home so yes i guess i guess on one hand i did kind of feel like you know a bit of a big brother really you know just trying to you know be encouraging be sympathetic of the fact that you know this, this is the first time away from home so it's going to be i don't know what's going on it's going to be like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're like i've been there got the t-shirt and you know yeah. i know what's going on <laughs> so so much of it just like eh, it's fine it's cool don't worry you're safe uh <laughs> but uh yeah trying to convince an 18 year old of that is um yeah not not the easiest thing in the world no uh, let's just say no definitely not yeah uh so the degree i studied there was new for my uni at the time so i was a bit of a guinea pig for it but right. it doesn't look like they're doing it anymore uh so my degree was uh, a four-year course it was law with spanish and it was split roughly two parts law to one part Spanish. And the third year was a sandwich year. And I spent that studying in Spain. I was studying the first year of the law degree at the University of Salamanca. So that was you know, a law degree with its own lexicon and vocabulary in what wow. was to me a foreign language. That, yeah. I mean, was that hard? <laughs> Put it this way, I had my heart in my mouth a lot of the times there because um, you know, just trying to get my brain to think in Spanish after what was like 20 years of only thinking in English. Yes. Uh, difficult. So, yeah, there was a lot of uh, gulp moments whilst I, I was can, there. I can imagine that must be the toughest thing because law in its own right is pretty tough. <laughs> so combine that with a foreign language and I don't know what that must have been like I mean I'm originally from the Netherlands and when we came to England in 1977 we were told that we needed to continue going I was 17 and we needed to go to school and um, I went no way how can I study in English I, you know I could speak English because all Dutch people do uh, you know, I could read English, I could write it. And I said, no, I need I need to find a job where I could use my Dutch language as well as develop my English language skills. I had no confidence to study in a foreign language. So hat off to you for doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but certainly a year of that was uh, more than enough for me, really. Yes. And we got to a point towards the end of that year where I I just had enough really i was i was tired i was exhausted and i was just ready to come home and finish my degree off yeah yeah absolutely but the one thing i, I did notice was it was a huge change going from guided study at school to more self-guided study and there were plenty of things that i didn't get right at the time i'm i'll freely admit that now some of those were because i just didn't understand how my brain worked at the time so it felt like i was working against it rather than with it and I guess I didn't know how to ask for assistance at the time because I thought we were just expected to be fully getting on with things and not really approach tutors if we were struggling which looking yeah. back on things now big mistake biggest mm. mistake I made there um, and in terms of like the social side of things as well um, I was active in a couple of societies while I was there I was I was in a music society where I uh, get together with other musicians we'd we play, we put on, some, put on some small shows at the university, like in the students' union, and we play for some other venues in Nottingham City Centre, like a couple of bars um, every now and again. Yeah. Uh, and I go to a couple of events with the Law Society uh, when I had the chance to, but after like full days of legal work, most days of the week and weekends, I realised that I, I just needed a break and yeah. I just needed that time to refresh really and just decompress so mm. yeah those kinds of events were few and far between um i wish i'd gotten involved in more but hey ho um such is life mm. uh and so i left my undergrad university with a 2-2 result uh kind of underwhelming when i look at it in isolation but yeah. didn't have the best time uh navigating the best way for me to learn and study due to again not really understanding my brain not yes. really understanding my challenges some personal issues that were going on at the time that were impacting my ability to learn and study. And quite frankly, my priority for that particular period was just to simply stay as well as I could. And I guess to stay alive really, um, cause it got kind of, it got kind of low really mm. uh, to the point mm. where, you know, there was an intervention by university counselors 
um, because I was, yeah, I, I was really, really struggling at that time. So yeah. I'm glad they inter- glad they intervened, and I'm glad that you know, well, it worked well enough so that I'm here today. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I, I really can't fault them for that. I can't fault the student services there. It's good. But uh, post grad university, thankfully, was so much different and so much better. Um, I I started studying post grad uh, university at the Montfort. Uh, it was uh, it was a post grad legal practice diploma. It was, yeah, in 2017, five years later, and me and my classmates at the time were all so much more grown up. We were all so much more mature, sensible. Mm. We had our priorities in order, not just around studying, but around everything else in our lives as well, like family, work, uh, everything, really. So yeah. it made it so much more of a pleasure to work with everyone, knowing that you know we we're all so supportive of each other. We all wanted each other to succeed, and we all knew exactly how much work we were putting in to our futures really i mean yes w- i mean would that have been the case for me had i gone straight into postgrad after my undergrad possibly not because i think at 22 i was still not quite mature enough and not quite wise enough to go straight into postgrad um mm. i really think i would have struggled and i was burning out at the time i'm not gonna lie yeah so but i guess we'll never know really or i'll never know but i'm glad that i waited until 2017 to start and so that i could have that real world knowledge and wisdom that I could bring with me to to my my uni work that could help me better understand what I was learning. So, mm. yeah, in terms of decisions I can make, I think that was the best one I made for myself at the time. And and how old were you out of interest when you started that post grad course? Uh, when I started my post grad legal legal diploma, I was twenty seven. Yeah, so you know more about the brain than I do. But one thing I do know and I did learn, whether it's true or not, I don't know. Um, But our brain up until the age of 25 is in major development, isn't it? It hasn't all formed itself yet. They say or suggest that around the age of 25, could be 24, could be 26, I don't know, then our brain is pretty much done its stuff in terms of its development. And it means that our executive brain, the part, the frontal lobe, where we make decisions about ourselves and others and our life, we are better informed to make better decisions in at those times. So it's really, really interesting how you said, I'm glad I waited until that time because I have I have more awareness about, you know, the world, the life and everything else around it. And I had a better time than studying as well. So it's it's fascinating. So there must be some truth in that um, where you felt better prepared around that age. I would imagine so. I mean, not being a you know neuroscientist or psychologist myself um, and only mm. really having my own experiences to go on. I can say that 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 brings about true for me really you know like up to the age of 25 yes I was still developing myself my my processes and my identity if you will yes um so yeah I I I didn't have much capacity to take on a huge amount more other than you know university study up until 22 and then my first job at 24 Mm. um yeah even even trying to do some part part-time study alongside my first job was you know was a struggle really and I didn't do very well at that and sadly failed that short course that I did so that sounds about right that you know after 24 25 or so we're <clears> a lot more you know our brains are a lot more developed and yes. we're a lot more aware of you know what works for us what doesn't work for us and that we can put those processes in place yeah so yeah, yeah. I'd say that sounds about right <laughs> excuse me yeah fascinating and so what happened next then after you did that course well it was in 2014 that I found my first paid job um and the first step on the ladder to get into where I am today yeah so this would have been about 18 months or so after graduating undergrad uh, but not quite at postgrad yet yes my yeah so uh, in terms of yeah, in terms of work history over the last 
nearly nine years or so, it feels like I've done so many jobs, really, you know, so many jobs, so many different workplaces and different industries as well. I yeah. mean, as a bit of a as a bit of a like colorful summary, I suppose, uh, they've included, you know, the call center of a national charity, uh, a training course provider for um, wills, trust, estate and succession planning lawyers and practitioners. Mm -hmm. uh, along with like tax advisors, accountants, and people working in um, those those professions, I spent some time in local government um, preparing settlement agreements. Uh, I spent some time in a telecoms operator uh, preparing more agreements to leave uh, equipment on site so the end users could get a service. I had a couple of um, stints in private practice uh, law firms, so firms of solicitors. One in Birmingham and another remotely in uh, in the southeast I was doing a range of uh, work there, a range of different practice areas and different tasks, really. So they, they were really, really good uh, training opportunities. Uh, yeah, COVID hit in 2020. Uh, so I was made redundant at that point, which sucked, but there wasn't mm. any, anything that I could do about it. No. Uh, and then most recently, I did some work for about six months or so for an environmental nonprofit where I was assisting with uh, some research tasks for senior lawyers. And I was using my contact contract preparation skills to prepare engagement agreements for like external partners, external councils to like be onboarded and do some work for the company I was I was with at the time. Yeah. And yeah, um, and because I don't like to make things easy for myself, uh, since <laughs> early 2022, <laughs> this, uh, yeah, this is going to be a recurring theme, I think, uh, not making things easy for myself. Uh, yeah, in early 2022, I uh, took on another couple of jobs uh, whilst I had a bit of time to myself. Uh, so I became a regular writer for the legal content and resource platform, lawcareers.net, and I've assisted with some workplace assessments for uh, a company called Priest Puddle. They work in the autism and neurodivergence inclusion sphere, staffed by neurodivergence, and they work with associates like me who ourselves are neurodivergent. So, yeah, I've had opportunities to use skills that I've developed over the last couple of years that were originally for fun and enjoyment, yes. along with my own personal experiences to yeah, continue my goal to help as many people as I can, like aspiring lawyers looking for some insight as to life as a paralegal or life in a lot of different workplaces, or to help you know larger companies and larger bodies better include and welcome neurodivergent staff and clients by mm. working with them as to how they can adjust workplaces, uh, processes, applications, everything like that. Really, it's it was super super fulfilling to me to be able to get involved in that and i'm still with still doing work for those two companies to this day and i'm i'm loving it really i'm really really enjoying myself oh that's brilliant i'm i'm really happy to hear that and so just to so with with that whole journey of doing all of these other jobs and then the redundancy and everything how did you pick yourself up after that you know the the redundancy thing and the covid thing and then how you got going again when things started to open up and now you've got these jobs that you you're doing uh, presumably they're all kind of part-time ish are they yeah they are, they are yeah part-time remote flexible flexible work yeah brilliant so that really suits you i would imagine as well yeah it does, yeah. Um, it was it was quite interesting when um, when twenty twenty happened. Really, um, I remember at the time as soon as we as soon as we heard, you know, you must stay at home for the first time. Yes. Uh, and after I got the call to say, Phil, we're terminating your contract. It's a redundancy. I guess at the time, I was quite glad that it happened. Really, it was a bit of a blessing in disguise because at the time mm. I was exhausted really I was tired I felt felt like I was burning out as well and I felt yeah. like I was doing so much work uh to try and you know progress myself and try and get myself to the place where I wanted to be yeah that I neglected myself for a lot of the times really you know I didn't get enough rest I didn't really 
eat as, as as well as I could have done, really. I didn't really sleep as well as I could have done, really. Mm. Whether mm. that's just because I had so much going on or my brain just wouldn't shut up. Yes. Or just or, or 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 whether it was anything else, really. So as twisted as it sounds, I think what I needed was a good lockdown, really. Just like a bit of a yes. a bit of a pause, really. A just reset. To, yeah, just a step back, take stock of myself, um, think about what's important to me and just spend some time working on that, really, just working to try and recharge my battery, mm. if you will, ready for ready for my next opportunity. Uh, but th- there was plenty I was getting involved in in 2020 anyway. There were so many uh, online courses, online programs that I could get involved in yes. where I could just keep my skills going, keep my brain in like like ticking over in work mode. And mm. just keep my learning going as well. So yeah. I'm really, I'm really happy that those, that those popped up, really. Um, but it's just a shame that it took, you know, a global viral pandemic for things like that to come to the forefront of, you know, of all of our minds and think, yeah, this is a viable thing that we could do. Mm. When, you know, realistically, these kinds of things could have helped so many people who were maybe struggling to access opportunities pre 2020 and just not having that knowledge, not having that awareness that they were there feels like it hindered us really. And it feels like, you know, it hindered certainly for me, my, my learning, my progression and just my ability to look elsewhere, try a few new things and see what's stuck really. Yeah. Yeah. And did any of it stick? It did um, happily. Um, It was in 2021 after uh, like after lockdown one, where I was back in work and I was doing some corporate and commercial work. Um, a lot of it was involving business acquisitions, management buyouts, uh, mergers and acquisitions, that kind of work. Yes. And I remember doing online courses and programs specifically in that subject area. So I felt like I was coming into it you know, more prepared than I would have been had I just left one job and then went straight into another and was completely, completely green, if you yes. will. Yes. Brilliant. Well done. So that was a a whole journey that you hadn't designed for yourself, but it was a welcome diversion on that journey to get you to a place where you were then prepared for the next job. <laughs> so brilliant. Yeah, it's um there are a lot of blessings in disguise that uh, all of us uh have as we go through life really that you know we didn't realize that we needed but actually when it happens we think yeah kind of needed this so definitely 2020 was a real benefit for me um as you know as as twisted as it sounds uh because it just gave me the chance to reset and i suppose refocus really and yeah recharge my battery ready for my next opportunity we we have a word for that at home here um when these things come your way and even though they may be stressful or upsetting or not great. Um, we call them gifts. And they may not be a gift right in the moment, but, you know, the other saying is this too will pass. And mm. once you get past it, <laughs> then you can look back on it and go, actually, it was a gift, you know. <laughs> It was a gift that that happened to me. And because actually, as a result of it, I'm in a better place or I'm in a better direction and it has all worked out for the best. So well done uh, for attracting that into your life. So so the, the roles that you're involved with right now, and of course, I completely get it that you couldn't just do one role. <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, listening to your journey and everything now, I completely get that. But how did you find those roles for yourself? How did they come about? This is quite interesting, actually. Um, In 2020, uh, when we were all in pandemic mode, uh, I I got myself online and I started putting some effort into like creating my brand, if you will, like my, my digital extension of myself. Yes. Um, and that came about by my creating written blogs and articles and creating a few videos uh, under the name, the neurodivergent lawyer. And, right. you know, 
that that became a brand and like a sort of identification for myself over those couple of years where I've been able to share authentic experiences of you know what it's like to be an autistic aspiring lawyer as well as you know unique perspectives my unique views on things like whether it's work or study or life or or anything yeah and whilst I was getting online I was also um really more deeply connecting with other aspiring lawyers uh trainees graduates and some final year students as well and it was a really really wholesome community that formed at that point uh, because we mm. were all in the same boat if you will where you know because of uh because of you know companies closing up the doors um due to well d- due to the riskiness of you know operating in a pandemic yes um yeah, we were we were all in the same boat looking for opportunities and we we're all supporting each other and we were all, you know, encouraging each other on, really. And someone, I can't remember the name of them, and it's gonna I'm gonna be kicking myself for this. But, <laughs> That's a matter. Uh, someone that I spoke to uh suggested that I take the written blogs and articles that I was writing a bit more um a bit more I, I hesitate to use the word mainstream, really, but, you know, offer them to a much larger platform, if you will. Right. And that platform was lawcareers.net. Um, at the time, I thought, really, are they really going to want to hear from me? I'm not a typical <laughs> aspiring lawyer at all. Like, you know, I'm, I, I was 30 at the time. I was quite old to be a trainee and I wasn't following, you know, the standard well-trodden route that every mm. other aspiring lawyer was following yeah. simply because it wasn't accessible for me. So I was creating my own journey if you will I was using another route and just trying to curate it really for myself yes um but yeah looking back on that you know hello imposter syndrome um yes but yeah they they really encouraged me just to just to give it a go really you know what Mm. have I got to lose get in touch with them and see if they'd be interested in me writing an article for them on you know the topic that was really close to my heart which was uh neurodiversity in law neurodivergence um experiences and 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 everything like that i had to look through some of the written articles that others had written on the platform i didn't see anything at the time so i thought this is new maybe they could benefit from it and absolutely i've got those personal experiences so again i created another opportunity for myself and you know i'm i'm glad that i had that encouragement really and uh if you will that kind of kick up the backside really you have to get myself going yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the, I, thing, the thing is, the, there's one thing people giving you advice and giving you a, a, a gentle kick up the backside, but there is something else than to take action upon it because you could have dismissed it and gone, you know, imposter syndrome, that's me. And I'm not going any further beyond that. And don't, not believing that people will be interested in me of course they won't be interested in me why would they be um and so you still had to take action and kind of push through that barrier and contact them so well done (laughs) well done to you it was it was definitely a case of you know why not got nothing to lose so yes. it, it kind of kind of felt like I was tapping into 16 year old me um uh, wanted to try so many different things at school and having that why not mentality so mm, mm. yeah but I'm really glad I did actually um I've wrote um since mid 2020 I've written three guest articles for them in and around full-time jobs and then in uh February 2020 I was invited onto the lawcareers.net podcast uh, which was really lovely. Uh, it was published in uh, Mar- March 2022. Uh, and then it was at that point where they offered me a more regular role with them. Um, and yeah, they've been really good to me uh, with you know, that support, that encouragement, and you know, just be- being there to answer some questions that I had and maybe just like, reassure myself, really. So I was, yes. I was really, really quick to say yes, really. And uh, the fact that it was something that I could do alongside other jobs as well made it all the more appealing, really. And yeah, no, I'm I'm really happy that I did that. And since then, I've I've been invited to award ceremonies that they've been putting on. I've been invited to other events that they've been putting on for other aspiring lawyers. And in mid 2022, I was invited to the launch of their own internal uh, neurodiversity network. Uh, again, to 
like open a network up, share some experiences, why it's so important to me and what we can all do for folks like me and other autistic aspiring lawyers, neurodivergent other aspiring lawyers. Um, and it, it, it's so, so heartwarming and affirming that my experiences and my perspectives mean something to people. Yes. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah. Because the world hasn't got enough knowledge about the world of, as you say, neurodivergent people. And we, we do need to be better educated about it. And I think they do say, don't they? Um, I don't like the phrase, but it's, you know, I've heard people say, well, we are all somewhere on the autistic spectrum anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't like that phrase at all. No, that's no. And 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 that's like a, a put down almost um, to say, oh, well, there is no difference type of thing. People try to say it in a supportive way, but it's actually contradictory to that. I mean, I get it. They want to be supportive and, you know, they want to be, you know, encouraging that, that that's, that's great. But the phrase we're all somewhere on the autistic spectrum. It doesn't sit well with me at all. It doesn't sit well no. with you know, other autistic people I know either. Cause to me, that just sounds like, um, like my, my own experiences are being invalidated. My own Correct. skills are being invalidated and the challenges that I face in life, in work and everything, uh, are uh, they they don't matter really but yes but they do because this is this is our lives this is our identities and it means something to us and yeah. you know to take away our identities and take away the things that make us us is just it, it, it's incredibly hurtful really yes. and I, I i i can't really stand for it really um yeah but but to be honest with you that's not the worst thing that um has been said to us i mean certainly not to me either right um, yeah you, you know how i said that my uh, my journey so far was uh, quite colorful well um yeah some of the um i can't still I, I still can't like remove the fact that this route to where i'm at today has been difficult and there has been difficult and quite hurtful experiences that i've had to encounter um around you know a, a lot of times it is around attitudes really and around preconceptions that other people have of autistic people neurodivergent people i mean i mean just to give you an example of a few things that i've encountered yes, i mean I, i've had to deal with you know quite ableist comments about me or to me uh like in work in life things like that some mm. of the worst things i've experienced have been he's special needs he's untouchable um the mm -hmm. fact that we have spent a lot of time and effort and money in accommodating you. Uh, my personal mm -hmm. favorite, I have to admit, and I'm going to apologize for the language right now. Uh, I had somebody say to me on the shop floor, like straight to my face with a, another couple of people in earshot. They said to me, autism means you're a little shit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's uh, that wasn't pleasant at all, really. No. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's like attempts to shame me for being born with the brain that I did and for the fact that you know in work I do need um reasonable adjustments in order to help me function and to be at my best and to help me process the information that's there so that I can do the best work I can really. yes yeah you know, other things as well as I've, I've been threatened with dismissal from one job because uh I wasn't on the same level as my other colleagues who were not neurodivergent and had been doing the same job as me for more than a year. Yeah. Uh, I was then fired from another job for that very same reason. You're a different job because I wasn't the same level after a few months than uh, compared to my colleagues who've been doing the job for a year and actually designed a lot of the processes themselves, which I was struggling to get my head around. Really. Mm. Mm. I had recruiters say to me that I should remove mentions of disability and autism from my CV because employers will see it as a reason not to employ me. Oh. Uh, and I've had another recruiter working at um, one workplace that I applied to say that 
they weren't going to grant me the reasonable adjustments that I asked for, uh, despite my saying, this is why I need them. And if you do this, I can show my best. Their reason was it would put me at an unfair advantage compared to other candidates. Hmm. Yeah, needless to say, I didn't take that uh, particularly happily. And uh, no. yeah, they're, <laughs> they're not going to get another application from me, that's for sure. And yeah, I, I say this not to glorify a struggle or anything, but just to point out that even in today's world, discrimination and ignorance is still there. And even if it's not overt, it's still quite insidious, really. It's still quite under under the surface. Um, and, you know, these are some of, these are some of the worst experiences that I've had yes. in uh, in my journey up until this point, really. Um well, I appreciate you sharing yeah. them. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got them out of you. And at the same time, I'm sorry that you've had to experience it. Um, do I say it's a gift in some way that you are now able to write about these things and educate people a little bit through the blog posts that you're now writing and, and the advice that you're giving people? Um because you've experienced those things, you know they exist, and therefore you can talk with authority and experience and help educate people. Do you believe ed there's more education required even, you know, in schools? You know, how do they deal with it in schools? Do they deal with it from the point of view saying, oh, well, we'll just separate those people out from the mainstream um is that how they deal with it today it shouldn't be really i don't think um no no i mean because it by doing that um and I, I i suppose as well if we were to translate it to like the adult world as well um i've seen specific like neurodiversity hiring programs and like aut autistic hiring programs as well um to try and attract more and more autistic people into companies that, that are putting them on like big big tech companies and like really really big like really really big publicly known companies as well um great that they're making an effort in that regard but by doing that it there's a couple of things that i notice really number one is you run the risk of othering us by saying you know we're putting on this program specifically for you because you can't go through the standard program that we have yes but then second as a follow-on to that why not make the standard hiring program a lot more accessible and a lot more inclusive so that you know folks like us neurodivergent autistics um everyone else shouldn't feel like they have to go through a separate hiring program um you know, you know simply because the hiring company doesn't feel like we're worthy or we're capable of going through the standard hiring program mm. and it was it, it's things like that that encouraged me to get involved with crease puddle um and get involved with you know the, the neurodivergence inclusion work and you know a lot more meaningful work yeah really. um because if i'm able to use my own personal experiences of that and of everything negative and everything hurtful that's happened and use it as like an educational tool if you will and like an awareness tool uh to try and help like crease puddles clients and in turn others that are you know maybe struggling to hire autistic or neurodivergent people yes then 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 great that would be really really fulfilling for me and i'm really glad i'm getting involved in that and in terms of like bringing it back to schools as well um i think it's important to realize that autistic children grow up to be autistic adults you know we don't all of a sudden turn the autism up as soon as we turn 18 you no. know it's it's a hardwired divergence that's in our brains that you know and and it's it's the identity that we are throughout life regardless of when we have that identification really yeah. and so you know othering autistic children in school is really setting them up poorly for later life I, I find because it's given them the impression that you know they're not capable of being in the same trench if you will as other you know non-autistic or non-neurodivergent people and you know almost almost gives the impression that hiring companies creating specific neurodivergence 
hiring programs are like doing us a favor quote if you will um well but... there's two <laughs> things there's two things you're right it's that we're doing you a favor because we've created a program so you can succeed um and it's also a tick box exercise to say we've done our social inclusion bit haven't we <laughs> it's true though isn't it that's what they do it, 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 go, it is sadly yeah yeah Just... oh we can we can put this in our annual report now that we've ticked that box so now our consumers will want to buy more from us because i mean i'm being facetious apologies i i have no evidence that this is actually happening so i'll say for the record <laughs> it's just a feeling i've seen companies i've worked in companies bigger companies where you know things are done just so they can tick a box and it can go in the annual report um so we all know it happens remains. yeah yeah, yeah the, the question remains though how is that meaningfully you know helping or supporting or including you know, autistic workers, for instance, you know, applicants who want to work for that particular company because they realize, oh, there's, you know, there's support available for autistic staff. That's, that sounds good. We're going to apply to that. Mm. And then it turns out that it, it is a tick box exercise and the support available is at worst conditional, mm. really, like, like, like conditional upon, say, performance, conditional upon, you know, meeting certain expectations, th things like that. And, yeah, that that that's when it starts to get, again, really, really insidious, and again, that's the reason why I'm why I'm really getting involved much more heavily with greater, like, workplace inclusion and neuro neurodivergence inclusion as well. Mm. And that's that's the reason why like I feel like I'm in the conception stage of being able to offer my own services going forward around, you know that around that particular topic area um you know i've got my own experiences i've got my own perspectives and knowledge on the subject and i've yes. been able to build skills with all the jobs that i've been working in mm. and i feel confident uh hopefully later this year once i get all the documentation and uh once i get a couple of clients sorted i've already got a couple already potentially um right. so i just so i just need to you know check back in with people that's yeah, later later this year, I really do hope to be able to offer much more uh, full inclusion services from the perspective of, you know, an autistic aspirant lawyer. Hopefully, yes. specifically for law firms who, you know, historically, you know, I don't mean this as like any kind of challenge, but I've noticed that some are still a little bit slow uh, to the mark when it comes to disability inclusion and neurodivergence inclusion. Mm. I see 2023 as being, you know, the year for um, for much greater work in this sphere and for much greater input from us, the neurodivergent community, to yes. get involved with, you know, th things like this and to have our to have our voices heard, if you will, to have our experiences valued and, mm. you know, to have our work valued, knowing full well that, you know, certainly from my perspective, I'm doing something for my community i'm doing something to make processes a lot smoother for like talented workers talented lawyers who themselves are autistic or neurodivergent yeah to be able to access you know the highest possible quality of work and training and be able to you know make the kind of life that they want for themselves yeah. you know that's unique to them and that works for them not anybody else but for them and being able to work with larger companies and larger law firms to be able to do this and to put that in place to really 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 support and include and welcome you know us talented lawyers that's that to me is going to be super super fulfilling and i i'm really really excited to get started on that later later this year so you, you are yeah. so passionate about it and uh, it really comes through and i know whatever you're building for yourself is going to be incredibly successful because you have such a belief in it and you're, you've got so much knowledge that you can share with people and the whole kind of education piece of it. So well done, man. That's really, really good. Really good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's also a case of like, there's, 
there's a quote that I love from a movie that I love, actually, that I think really, really rings true for what I want to achieve later in life. And that yeah. is that everyone fails at who they're supposed to be. But the measure of a person is how well they succeed at being who they are. And it's because of this that I've decided I'm not going to let failures to navigate a qualification route that everyone else has taken, but I know isn't for me. Mm. I'm not going to let failures to be the ideal candidate for someone else or make myself into the most ideal person that someone else who may or may not fully understand me yeah. wants me to be and wants to work with. I'm not going to let any of that deter me from achieving what I want to set out to achieve, from accessing the work and the training that I need in order to reach my goal of qualification as a lawyer. I'm not going to let that deter me from working on being the best version of myself and being someone who the right people want to work with because I'm me, because I'm my own yes. person, and because I'm the kind of person that you know so many others do genuinely want to work with. Yeah, it sounds great. It sounds really great. Very motivational. And it's not <clears throat> what you're doing and what you're sharing with the listeners is not just for neurodivergence. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's for everybody. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, your philosophy is fantastic. And and you're, you're, you know, the fact all the things that you're embracing is really, really great. Um, and it and it really comes across um, in the way that you share your vision, and I love it. So thank you so much for for doing that. And how can people? So with the development of your business or any of the other work that you're doing, um, how can people learn more about that, Phil? And how could they get in touch with you if they want to use your services? Yeah, uh, LinkedIn is the main social media platform that I use. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to put a link to my profile in uh, in the podcast bio. Yeah, oh yes, uh, definitely. Great. Thanks. And from that, you'll be able to uh, find the, the company page that I have for uh, my own brand and my own platform uh, called The Neurodivergent Lawyer. And it's on that page that I'm sharing uh, my own articles that I'm writing, uh, the work I'm doing for lawcareers.net and Priest Puddle, and any other work I'm doing in, in this sphere that, you know, that, that means something to me and that I'm very, very proud of. I'm I'm, I'm I'm always happy to share things like that. I'm always happy to uh, get in touch with folks who do want to learn more and who would like to, you know, who'd like to engage me and use me to try and help themselves be better for themselves or for you know the rest of the neurodivergent community. And you know, I'm I'm happy to speak to anybody, and you know, I'm happy to connect with anybody. You know, I don't I don't find it uh, strange that absolutely everybody wants to connect with me. I love um, I love making those relationships i love making those connections so yeah by all means if if anybody listening does want to get in touch then yeah i'm here i'm free i'm open so yeah go for it brilliant <laughs> sounds good to me and how long have you got left in terms of the because you mentioned you're a paralegal which i don't completely understand what that means i know you're obviously involved with law and then to become a fully fledged lawyer, how long how long will that take? For me, because I'm taking a different route to the standard uh, training contract. Um, yes. Instead, I'm working to become a legal executive, so it has its own it has its own route with um, Silex, the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives. With the work I've done so far, I've got roughly a year until I okay. um, un until I'm able to uh, fully qualify. So hopefully by the end of 2023 or maybe early 2024, um, that'll be my training done. I'll be a fully fledged lawyer. And yeah, that's that's something I'm really looking forward to. Scary, Fun. but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Look, there's nothing you have to be scared about at all with what you've done. Uh, so that sounds really exciting. Well, um, is there anything else you would have liked to have said that I haven't covered as yet? <laughs> haven't asked you. Uh, I, I do feel like we've covered a lot, really. And uh, yeah, it feels like we've covered so many aspects of my life and my journey. And 
Yeah, no, on honestly, Michael, I'm just really thankful that uh, you've offered me this space to you know share myself, share my story, and I suppose just help me continue to believe in myself and believe that what I'm doing is is good, it's right for me, and that uh, I'm on the right path, really, and that I and that I do want to continue to do fulfilling work. So, yeah, no, thank you very, very much for offering me your space. It's it's really, really lovely of you. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure and it's been a fantastic first interview for of 2023 uh, and I've really really enjoyed hearing your story and the journey that you've been on it's really fascinating and I, I really want to wish you massive success with the ongoing developments do keep us posted and uh, make sure that obviously in the bio I can't say that you are a lawyer yet but when you do let me know and I'll change the bio. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly will. Yes, definitely. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Phil. Um, take care and uh, let's keep in touch and all the best for now. Lovely. Thank you again, Michael. Take care. Bye now. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.